Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the team Calcutta Comparatives 1919, I take this privilege to warmly welcome you to the seventh lecture of the lecture series on this platform. Calcutta Comparatives 1919 is an independent forum for research scholars of humanities and social sciences. It carries the legacy of the academic study of Indian languages and literature envisioned by Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee and introduced in 1919 at the University of Calcutta. Later in 2005, a new department was established which continues to carry on with the research in Indian languages. Calcutta Comparatives 1919 took inspiration from this history and it is a platform for sharing research interests and ideas. We are organizing online lectures on various interdisciplinary topics to be delivered by academicians and distinguished research scholars of different fields. Thank you for joining us today. Today we have with us very eminent Professor Didier Koster with us. And I will now request Purvasha Monti to introduce our speaker of the day. And today Professor Koster will be speaking on heteroglossia in cosmopolitan perspective, Jhumpalairi's leap across to Italy. Purvasha, over to you. Thank you, Aratrika Di. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Uh, now, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Didier Kost, uh, who is Professor Emeritus of Comparative Literature at Bordeaux Montani University. He earned his PhD in French studies aesthetics uh, from the University of Sydney. Uh, and uh, 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 he has also done his PhD in Spanish studies uh, from the University of Provence and his uh, uh, habilitation uh, delete in comparative literature and literature from the University of Lille. Besides France, uh, he has taught comparative literature and literary theory, translation studies, semiotics and cultural history in Belgium, Australia, Spain, Canada, the USA, Argentina and Tunisia and has been twice a research scholar of Jawaharlal Nehru University as well as guest of Jadupur University. He has published over 150 papers in English, French and Spanish in international channels and edited collections. Narrative as Communications uh, 1989 was a landmark in the field of narrative theory. He is the author of the article Narrative Theory of the Oxford uh, Research Encyclopedia of Literature online 2017 in print 2021 and currently a member uh, of the advisory board of the new series approaches to the novel in the field of cosmopolitan studies professor cost has edited two special issues of the journal it appears in 2017 with christina kona uh, university bordeaux montania and nicoletta predu just town university he's editing migrating minds theories and practices of cultural cosmopolitanism a collection of 20 original essays under contract with rootlate his next monograph is titled against origins and destinations a cosmopolitan approach to literature modern and contemporary Indian literatures and culture have been his privileged area of inquiry since the late 1990s. As a literary translator of English, Spanish and Catalan language fiction, poetry and essays, he received the highest French national award in 1977. He founded and chaired the Noises International Cultural Foundation for Literature and the Arts. He is also a novelist poet and playwright in French, English and Spanish uh, from his uh, first novel and first poetry collection in 1963 to his bilingual novel, Dies in Sydney, uh, Paris uh, 2005. His last published book of poetry, Indian Poems, Calcutta Writers' Workshop 2019. Uh, with a forward by Rukmini Vanar and more formal poetry collections in English and Spanish are uh, being prepared for publication. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, here, uh, Professor Cost. Uh, now you may start your presentation. This virtual floor is yours. 
Over to Professor Cost. Thank you for this presentation. Exaggerated very much. So um, it is also a pleasure for me to uh, be given this opportunity to divulge uh, my uh, provocative views on cosmopolitanism once more <clears throat> to a very different public <clears throat> and uh, on a media to which I am not used yet. Uh, my lecture is titled uh, Heteroglossia in Cosmopolitan Perspective, Jumpa Lahiri's Leap Across to Italian. It will come in four parts. One, on the nature of heteroglossia. Two, Jumpa Lahiri's versus Indian heteroglossia. Three, foreignness in Lahiri's English fiction. And four, the leap to monolingual heteroglossia, and then is there anything left of India there? A gesture I deem essential to investigate in order to attempt an, experim an experimental cosmopolitan approach to literature is that of speaking and of writing in another voice and language than the one or the ones always already given and imposed to the subject of the experience of literature. So as to avoid forging a neologism such as alter voicing, I will call it heteroglossia. But this lexical item used by Bartin, as well as by some ethnolinguists and language acquisition specialists is in need of disambiguation. Heteroglossia, here taken at individual scale, is often seen as a result of exile, forced displacement or subalternity under an alien domination. It can be indicted by nativist criticism as treason to one's natural native culture and mother tongue, as fostering self exercisation complicit with die-hard imperialist orientalism and repressively interpreted as a multiply divine metaphoric sexuality involving exhibition, voyeurism, and prostitution. This lecture seeks to counter such views from a cosmopolitan standpoint, supported by an aesthetic approach to the political unconscious. It considers exodus as eros and the multifarious drive of literature for uh, the uh, language of other persons and communities is a manifestation of always dissenting desire, as an act of love better understood in terms of libidinal economy. The complex set of phenomena concerned is shared by literary translation, transcreation, by our multilingual literary creation, <clears throat> and cross-writing that is writing in an appropriated rather than a received language. From Casanova to Beckett, from Finnegania to the reinvented Ladino of some and fabricated Europanto, from Tagore to the many contemporary bilingual poets of Latin America through Rainer Maria Rilke and Fernando Pessoa, there are innumerable cases of linguistic mobility throughout the ages, and they are multiplying exponentially at the beginning of this second millennium. However, Jumpa Lahiri's relatively late metamorphosis into a writer in Italian is sufficiently unusual to deserve an in-depth study, whether or not we consider her as an Indian writer. While non-Basha writing, within the geographical limits of India is almost exclusively English and mobility between Indian languages is generally limited to neighboring idioms such as Urdu and Hindi uh, with Pemshan, for example, the South Asian diaspora of all generations has massively adopted English. On the other hand, earlier Indian writers who had begun their 
careers in English, such as Bankim and Ajneya, and had quickly reversed to their respective Indian languages, had done so for political, nationalist, and or anti-establishment reasons. John Palahiri, born in London of Bengali parents, raised and educated in the United States, had already become a highly successful writer by 2000, winning the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction at the young age of 32, a success constantly confirmed in subsequent years by multiple awards, institutional positions, and privileged links with prestigious sites of visibility such as the New Yorker and Princeton. We can say with certainty that in 2011, she had no career reason or political motive to adopt Italian, a relatively minor, non-international European language, especially when her mastery of the language at the time was too imperfect to use it as a literary vehicle of quality. Lahiri has now published three books of her own, directly written in Italian. In Altre Parole, 2015, Il Vestito dei Libri, 2016, and Dove Mi Trovo, 2018. The first one is an autobiographical sketch of her falling in love with Italian and her efforts to acquire full fluency in it. The second is a very short personal essay on book covers. The third, a short novel narrated in the first person by the exclusive protagonist, a lonely Italian woman in her late 40s. In Altre Parole has been much analyzed by critics and by the author herself. The sketch on book covers has been given little importance and Dove Mitrovo, whose English self-translation is yet to be published next month, has hardly been read so far as a novel or in any framework other than that of a testimony of its also state of mind and attitude regarding cultural and sentimental belonging or autonomy. After discussing some relevant terminology and theoretical tools, the present study aims at showing how a cosmopolitan comparative and world literature perspective can bring to Jun Palahiri's work at large new creative meanings and values that were offset by its naturalization as the production of a second generation Indian American writer. It undoubtedly is, and the thematic constants, as well as the recurrent settings of her short stories and novels in English, were there to reinforce a sense of semi-autobiographical expression in conformity to what could be expected of someone with her background. There are nevertheless other ways to approach this over and similar ones in languages acquired for de-linking purposes. Concentrating on Dove Mitrovo, I plan to investigate how alternative readings as an Italian an American and an Indian novel cannot lead to choose or prefer one of them, or to conclude that a more or less successful hybridity is the name of the game. We must instead counterintuitively accept the co-necessity cool of each of these divergent contextualizations in a global framework. The relative singularity of Lahiri's move and its exhibited performance belongs to a tradition of the new shared by all contemporary literatures, doubtlessly including those labeled Indian, even when their novelty has little to do with the real emergence and is more similar to a cyclical return of obsolete fashions. Lahiri's French case is therefore an invitation to experimentally de- and recontextualize, de- and refamiliarize as many modern Indian literary works as possible, beyond the touching and slightly enigmatic story of a one-of-a-kind linguistic defector, there lies the largely unexplored possibility of using contextually 
incongruous critical tools on literary works of any supposed provenance. My first part, my first movement, on the nature of heteroglossia. The gesture, I repeat, the gesture of speaking and writing in another voice and language than the one or the ones already given and imposed to the subject of the experience of literature is essential for the wording of this experience. That is to make it coincidental with an internalized perception of the unity without uniformity of humankind that the aesthetic use of language presupposes. This is a universal. Heteroglossia in literary production and reception has several quasi-synonyms, such as translingualism or cross-lingualism, but their prefixes stress change and passage. They maintain perhaps too insistently the ghostly co-presence of two or more previous languages with or within the languages actually used in textual practice. On the other hand, a neolingualism would evoke a convergent phenomenon with two interpretative options, either rejecting any prior linguistic and cultural system of thought and values, thus making comparison taboo, or keeping persistently the neo speaker under suspicion. Heteroglossia implies that a linguistic subject, a speaker and or addressee, or a group of such subjects, possesses one or more languages considered as primary and dominant in their mind and or practice. Whether this language of reference is a mother tongue or one that has substituted it or has become interchangeable with it in the course of life. Heteroglossia then is not simply opposed to monolingualism. It is a specification of plurilingualism by which one or more languages play the part, I insist, play the part of the given, while others play the part of the not given, the foreign. Whether this foreignness corresponds to that of another nation, another community, or another historical period. At collective scale, a group or a class of people may use a different language from their primary language or languages for ritual, economic, technological, educational purposes, etc. Until past the middle of the 20th century, the Roman Catholic Mass was celebrated in Latin, not in French, Spanish, German, Portuguese, and so on. Until the 20th century, Belgian Flemish bourgeois would speak French between them and a Flemish dialect with their servants or workers. Let us analyze etymologically the signifier heteroglossia. If it seems to have been forced as one possible translation of the Russian compound, excuse my Russian pronunciation, it's <laughs> insignificant, uh, the Russian compound rasno reche, that is other speechness used by Bartin, the hetero component, meaning different in Greek, can refer to the co-presence of different elements or features within a set, as in the adjective heterogeneous, or to an overall difference from, as in heterosexual. In the first case, a set is composed of things or people different from each other. A political demonstration, for instance, can group people of different social classes or communities with different claims. The second case, is interactive. One gender, by definition, is supposed to relate to a different one, not to itself. The Cambridge Dictionary offers two definitions of heteroglossia. One, I quote, in the literary field, the fact of there being two or more different types of language or opinions in a text. Two, in the linguistic field, the fact of there being two or more languages or types of languages in a place." End quote. Hetero, in these cases, is synonymous with plural or multi 
depending on the number of different objects in the set. It emphasizes variety without being concerned with the number of such objects. The presence of so-called foreign words, notions, figures, dictions, etc., in a text whose linguistic and ideological homogeneity is considered as a norm, is often seen, if not as a pathology resulting from the curse of Babel, at least as a symptom of various personality disorders, be they individual or collective. <clears throat> from an aesthetic point of view, such an unhappy, incomplete hybridity can be reproved <clears throat> as impurity, discordance, disharmony. From a semantic point of view, it makes interpretation more difficult. It lets both polysemy and obscurity proliferate. Generally, this kind of heteroglossia is associated with transition periods, exile, the plea of minorities, power struggles between classes or cultural communities, revolutions, a deficiency of sublimation, or else with imperialist enterprises that aim to digest the culture of the other as they exhibit its most visible signs as exotic trophies. It is not indicted, if it is not indicted for these reasons, it can be exalted as a resistance to imperialism and assimilation, as a way of queering the text, or as a tool for the quest of indigenous authenticity. Indian literatures in English or English translations of literatures in Basha languages that contain many native words or turns of phrases, as it also happens in some Maghrebian, African, and Creole literary works in French, can be valued for their respect for untranslatables or criticized for their excessive local color, their picturesque self exoticization for selling cheap the trappings of difference, as Western 19th century travelogues and novels of adventures <clears throat> used to do it, but with the aggravating circumstance of treason. Second movement, Jumpalahiris versus Indian heteroglossia. Jumpalahiris writings in English make little use of Bengali words and provide no transcriptions of Bengali phonetic variants in English. Her Italian writings are not heteroglossic in the same sense as Finnegan's Wake or even Amitav Ghosh's Ibis trilogy. They have nothing of a potpourri of tongues or dialects, endeavoring on the contrary to be tightly monolingual, limiting themselves to the most standard, if enhanced and cleverly exploited, modern Italian expression. The earlier stricture in English, marking the prodromes of an individual and radical linguistic shift, all the more radical because it buries as much as possible the traces of another previous embodiment in language, already created an untranslatability of its own. What has Lahiri's lead to Italian to do then with the various forms of Indian heteroglossia? Indian heteroglossia is at once an objective reality and a key motif for various ideological positions regarding the possibility and the necessity and naturalness or not of an Indian identity, paralleling and multiplying other divisions in terms of natural uh, regions, ethnicities, regions, castes, classes, and lifestyles that put under pressure the imagined community. As a describable reality, the specifically Indian heteroglossia has four aspects that are not always found together in other plurilingual nation states. One, a large number of languages, some of them very dissimilar, are spoken and now written within the borders of the Indian state 
and by Indian expatriates and their descendants. Two, India doesn't have a single unifying lingua franca spoken by the totality or even a clear majority of its population. Three, many Indians of different walks of life, not only intellectuals, scientists, business people, and the jet set, are by or plurilingual, being able to speak more than one basha, while an ever-increasing number can speak at least some English. Four, many Indians mix and combine two or more languages in their everyday communication. It would seem then that Indian heteroglossia is largely ignored in Jumpa's English fiction and completely alien to her Italian heteroglossia, or that the latter manifests a definite rejection of her inherited Indianness understood as a legacy of diversity, complexity, and entanglement in terms of epistemy, system of beliefs and values, and emotional attitudes. This is the not very nuanced interpretation offered by an Italian scholar who writes that, I quote in my translation. In Lahiri's case, the Italian language determines a double matricide as it reveals the abyss that she feels opening between her and Bengali, the language embodied by her parents on the one hand, and English on the other hand, that she describes as a stepmother." End quote. However, Jumpa's lexical practice and her diction in her English fiction seem to be much more complex than suggested by a stark contrast between a pre and a post abyssal position. If instead of interrogating the writer's identity and where she writes from, we care to analyze her texts in a reader oriented perspective, asking who can feel either at home or displaced, at ease or not, within the discursive space mapped by her writing. Jumpa Lahiri may have had many motivations to shift from the tongue of her education to another chosen language. But what all the written, uh, sorry, but what all the writers who have made similar moves share is something they frequently describe as falling in love with a sometimes laboriously acquired language perceived as a new home from whose windows they can see the world, uh, <clears throat> uh, their art, and themselves differently. In this respect, languages become more like musical instruments or artistic techniques than innate characteristics of a personality. The subject who practices them enters a dialogic relationship with them that clearly involves her or his whole former linguistic history, whether in terms of nostalgic memory, relaxing oblivion, compassion or hostility, but without letting the past overwhelm the present. And this is most important. Mastering, dominating the acquired language, bending it to one's will and whims can be the point for some who relate to it as they would to a conquered land, bringing the pride of a success story. But not every heteroglossic adventure needs to be so psychologically crude. A language is never possessed. It never belongs to anyone by birthright. Heteroglot writers are bound to realize, at least subconsciously, that mother tongues make the false promise of a security that they are unable to provide in the long term, long run. Heteroglossic, uh, heteroglossia seems to defamiliarize initial languages at the same time as it familiarizes the formerly unknown, little known, or hardly practiced one. But it also accomplishes the opposite in the background. 
the more one writes in a language, the more perspectives it opens, the more unexplored stretches make their appearance to the eye of the writer. It doesn't matter that many of these perspectives are mirages. When mirages dissipate, other realities, more remote horizons are revealed. Simultaneously, the relegated languages will shrink and appear more compact and simple than before, perhaps stereotyped. Heteroglossia culminates when what is said, written in the other language, in a language as other, generates a feeling of untranslatability, especially into the language or languages that have been left aside. Thus, in the sense of other speaking, other writing, heteroglossia is not by itself a cosmopolitan panacea. I shall now examine its limits as well as its contributions to the construction of a persona able to envisage literary products and phenomena from a properly cosmopolitan point of view and perform cosmopolitanism in the production and transmission of texts, discourses, meanings, and feelings. My third movement deals with foreignness and familiarity in Lahiri's English fiction. The contours and the socio-political and aesthetic implications of modern literary texts that are properly or even exemplarily plurilingual in a linguistic sense, like Finnegan's Wake, are extremely different from Jhumpa Lahiri's very moderately plurilingual English fictions of the Bengali diaspora, at once globalizing and highly localized. At the collective level of a plurilingual literary and cultural space, it seems that cosmopolitanism rises with the co-presence of a language that is not from here. But what happens when there are two here or no here at all, or only a virtual pole between two equally elusive locations, one left behind and the other never completely arrived at as described and indescribable in the case of many, if not all, of Lahiri's first and second generation migrant characters. In Lahiri's writings, a short story like uh, Rayol Durwan from the collection The Interpreter of Maladies exclusively set in Bengal and populated with Bengali characters only is exceptional in many respects, such as its focus on the humblest stairwell sweeper, Buri Ma, a half-crazed refugee from East Pakistan at the time. This feature, protagonizing the dam of the earth, is shared by much of Indian social realism and Italian neorealism. But destitute people and servants, except Deepa in the lowland, make only fleeting appearances elsewhere in Lahiri's fiction. In this context, the word Durwan, whose meaning, doorkeeper of an apartment building, is simply implied in the story by a list of tasks, acquires its full value by the specificity of its Urdu origin that would give Mughal luster to the lackluster condition of the petty bourgeois occupants of the building. An ordinary porter or doorkeeper or yet an international concierge wouldn't do to replace the dirty female sweeper who is eventually thrown out to starve, sleep and die on the street. The few Bengali words found in other short stories in the lowland or in the namesake retain a rather enigmatic status, especially when they are not translated, paraphrased, or otherwise explained. Food and objects associated with it, alongside with rites and festivities, architecture, urbanism, and clothing, are salient identity and personality markers of Lahiri's characters, communities, and generations in her English fiction. Among the 
and for Fletago, not so well known abroad, Bengali dishes, we find sandesh, payesh, and alugobi. that are definitely not part of the global fare in the manner of tandoori chicken. Among clothing items, beside the ubiquitous sari, we find the salwar kameez outfit and the more mysterious nagra slippers. Hindu religious festivals, such as the autumn worship of Durga, are unusually transcribed as a pujo rather than puja. On the other hand, the loose end of a sari on the, or the 11th day funeral ceremony described at some length are never called palo um, and uh, fada, respectively. Payesh is briefly explained as a warm rice pudding. Sandesh, rosogolas, and shanadal are not. It is difficult to guess the rationale of these choices if non-Indian or even non-Bengali readers could have a hard time with Sandesh. Why not call for Bengali and other Indian readers the Sindo mark of married women, a well-detailed ritual by its name? On the other hand, if I can guess what they stand for, lip flops or flip flops are footwear that I would call tongs in Australia or chapels in India. Non-North American English speakers will definitely need a dictionary to identify a ricer as a grating utensil, a Dutch oven as a casserole dish, a stoop as the uh, front steps of a house rather than a bent back. A Lazy Susan uh, as a revolving tray or yet the cribbage card game. The only readers who could be naturally at ease with all this Bangla, Pan Indian, and Anglo American vocabulary are Bengali migrants to the United States after spending a number of years in the new country or their American born children raised in the country without losing sight of their Bengali roots and traditions. The ideal reader is thus modeled on the majority of Lahiri's fictional characters who fall in these precise diasporic categories. However, the large sales of the namesake, the awards it received or was nominated for, as well as its internationally produced film adaptation by Mira Nair in 2006, show that its actual empirical readership is far from coinciding with the narrow fringe of Bengali intellectual and professional expatriates in North America. In a globalized world where mass migration is ever on the rise, where overtly malfunctioning families and uh, failing solidarities become the rule rather than the exception, and where people are obliged to shift to other languages more than once in the course of their lives or shuttle between languages in the course of a single conversation, it is an increasing number of global citizens or non-citizens uh, um, and migrating minds who, feeling both unsettled and forced to adapt what, uh, wherever they happen to reside at the moment, can identify with the thrilling discomfort of Lahiri's characters in their various environments. In other words, we can now recognize ourselves better in dystopia than in utopia, in fragmentation and modern or open and aleatory semiological literary regimes than in unity, in misunderstanding and secrecy than in the naturalized transparency of a readerly or legible world. The deceased temporalities, the unmappable specialities that were tragic and or absurd, tragically absurd or absurdly tragic, from Gogol to Beckett, through Kafka, among many others, or somehow re-enchanted by so-called magic realism, have become 
an inevitable, increasingly familiar norm in Lahiri's realism. As Shanachar is poured into Tupperware, we have become familiar with foreignness. Like the character of Gogol, we are all named after others, although it is supposed to mean entire encompassing all. The good name, Nick Hill, does not make one complete and self-sufficient any more than the ridiculous Gogol provisionally attributed in homage to a mad Russian writer and in memory of a derailment from which a father was miraculously saved in his youth. The unheimlich prevails when we all live in an unlimited, diffuse, random intertextuality, which turns out to include material culture as well, as literature, art, music, and religion. Ashima, who remains a Hindu, I quote, makes sandwiches with Bologna or roast beef, end quote, for Gogol's lunch in the morning. The unexpected is a new karma. My fourth movement, the leap to monolingual heteroglossia. Is there anything left of India there? Jhumpa Lahiri almost always foregrounds human types, social situations, and geographical sites of which she seems to have first-hand knowledge. In her short stories and her two novels in English, academics and university students abound. Two of them, from the namesake, Maxi and Mushumi, Gogol's main successive female partners, are involved in French culture, although they have no personal reason to develop a powerful affinity with the language and culture of this country. The fact that Mushumi can speak fluid French impresses Gogol. Among other forebodings, Ojumpa's leap to Italian, such as the epigraph of the lowland by Giorgio Bassani. Mushumi's dedication to French studies is motivated as follows. I quote, immersing herself in a third language, a third culture, had been her refuge. She approached French, unlike things American or Indian, without guilt or misgiving or expectation of any kind. It was easier to turn her back on the two countries that could claim her in favor of one that had no claims whatsoever." End quote. Is this discourse of liberation an idealistic delusion? Can one turn one's back to transmitted values without suffering the revenge of the path not taken? In the case of India, can't an attempt at leaving it behind be understood as something very Indian again. The ascetic, the severance gesture of a sannyasi in a more mundane fashion, or maybe the accomplishment of samsara during one's own lifetime. And again, can these interpretations be substantiated on the grounds of the literary techniques used in the two successive linguistic facets of Lahiri's work? As I said earlier, the shift from received languages to a deliberately acquired language as the exclusive vehicle of a literary work is primarily individual. This does not imply, however, that unmixed heteroglossia by choice is not socially motivated, but it is certainly not dictated by imperatives, such as the absence of outlets for productions uh, for one's productions in any other language than the one embraced, or the loss of fluency in the mother tongues of the speaker or writer. Self-referentiality combined with autobiographical, autofictional, first-person narration is common with writers who are self-conscious about their use of the language that uh, was not or was not supposed to be originally their own for reasons of nationality or cultural bringing. Jhumpa Lahiri 
was no exception when she shifted from English to Italian with in altre parole. The presentation blurb begins as follows. I quote in Italian to have the sound of it. <coughs> Questa è la storia di un colpo di fulmine, di un largo, di un lungo uh, corteggiamento, di una passione, di, di una passione profonda, quella di una scrittrice per una lingua straniera. This is a story of love at first sight, of a lengthy courtship, of a deep passion, the passion of a writer for a foreign language, in my translation. The epigraph is taken from Antonio Tabucchi's words about his shifting to Portuguese, from Italian, in Requiem, aptly subtitled Uma Alucinação, that recounts the wanderings in Lisboa of an Italian writer who has an appointment with the ghost of Fernando Pessoa. I quote, Avevo bisogno di una lingua differente, una lingua che fosse un luogo di affetto e di riflessione. End quote. Implicitly then, Italian has become for Lahiri a site of affection and reflection, as uh, Portuguese played this role for Tabuki. There is nevertheless the important difference between the two that it was not any particular literary or artistic model that fascinated Lahiri. In the first chapter of the book, a small lake around which the narrator walks for a month before daring to swim across serves as an allegory of her crossing the Atlantic to go to Italy and live there, immersing herself into Italian, I quote, without a life jacket. Love at first sight, or rather, the much more striking quasi-Olympian <clears throat> lightning stroke repeats itself for the same object as it does in the most romantic songs that say it's always the first time. As it elicits an increasing feeling of familiarity, a déjà vu perhaps, this object remains forever just slightly distant, distant enough to retain its mysterious attraction at once Heimlich and Unheimlich, albeit in a rather euphoric manner. The difference between a practical need and an urge, I have only the desire, she says, is determinant. After a year in Rome, during the long apprenticeship stay, recounted in Altre Parole, when Lahiri had to return to the US for a month, the deprivation of Italian on an everyday basis is a source of high anxiety and almost amounts to resentment. She explains this abysmal fear of loss as a fear of having lost what she has learned in Italian during her sojourn. But it is something much deeper and poignant than that. Lahiri realizes that her anxiety her sadness about Italian is the same as that of her parents mourning the lack of Bengali, their mother tongue, a clear sign that the acquisition of Italian is now synonymous with an adoption that could still be revoked, or as in her previous works of fiction, a marriage ending in divorce or widowhood. But when she questions her motivations for writing in Italian, she answers that she thus loses her authority, her firm and definite identity as a master author in her dominant language. As a result, she is freed from her past security, now living in precarious linguistic conditions, thrown out of her palace, threatened to become homeless at any moment. She has gained, I quote, the freedom to be imperfect. I quote again, from a creative point of view, there is nothing more dangerous than security, she adds. The book finishes with a very short story, staging a married man who has a dream about his wife driving a bodiless car 
There's a passenger he feared it would crash at any moment without the least protection. Unable to go back to sleep after the nightmare, he decides to wash a mountain of dishes left behind by the big dinner party given to celebrate his return from a two months trip abroad and tidy the kitchen to prepare breakfast. When he finds a dry slice of bread caught in the toaster, he imagines his wife preparing breakfast for a lover on the morning before his return, until he realizes that he has he had himself forgotten to eat that bread in the morning of his departure. Interpreting his dream, he discovers that he has been gliding through life with his wife without any accident, but always with darkness around. The scene and the style are certainly close to those of the Italian realist and neo-realist fictionists of the 1940s to the 1970s, especially Cesare Pavese, of whom Lahiri has said she is fond. It also reminds us very much of Carver's hyperrealism, Raymond Carver's hyperrealism that I will mention later. We find the same falsely dry, objective simplicity and short sentences in her first novel in Italian, Dove mi trovo. This novel, a first person narration contrary to the enunciative process of most of Lahiri's fiction in English, is structured in short chapters, each one a life slice, a scene on the street, at home, on a holiday, etc., of which the despondent narrator was an actual participant or witness, and thus a glimpse of her prevailing mood, her difficulty to communicate, and the overall failure of a whole life. Uh, <clears throat> time wasted rather than lost, and unlike Proust's Sphinx past, finally irrecoverable in writing. Differently from the past tense, third person narration in Interpreter of Melodies, however unfriendly its world could be, the present tense of narration in Dove mi trovo gives the dreariness of the recounted present an obsessive, existential, inherent, and perpetual character. Mediocrity, the flatness of drab ordinary lives, is foregrounded instead of despair. We are reminded again of Raymond Carver's hyperrealist cynicism, even more than of Italian neorealism that used to hold some tender feelings in store below the photographic surface. The discrepancy between the title of the Italian original and that of the English translation to come, it is the impersonal and unequivocal whereabouts also reveals otherwise unsuspected polysemic depths about Dove mi trovo, which literally means where I find myself as well as where I am. It announces that each scene of the narrative should be located, like many are, including the last one, sul marciapede, per strada, in treno, etc. But the second last, very short chapter is titled Da nessuna parte, from nowhere, and reiterates in more forceful terms the idea that only movement and radical change are life. That belonging nowhere is the sole certainty that prevents the stagnation and the wasting away of creative being. It is the price to pay for a passport to existence. Lahiri's willful and radical experiment with heteroglossia, presented as the adventure of a lifetime, conveys many lessons, not all of them as clear as the one above, which is itself complex. The mediation of heteroglossia, adopting and being adopted into a non-native language and culture, lets the creative subject discover and accept a negative cosmopolitan identity. Her foreignness everywhere is the warranter of her freedom of reinventing herself, dying 
and being reborn every time in a combination of mourning and ecstasy. However, by a double twist, she attributes, Lahiri attributes this need to detach herself from all ties, including the strongest and dearest ones, her parents, her principal and most secure language, English, to an origin, albeit an always already negative one, a void, an uncertainty, an initial indefinition, are not only an origin, but the determinant germ of a destiny, the destiny of having no destination. Taking into account the contemporary mode of literary production and reception, that is global on a global market, that of world literature, but must perform and produce the surplus value of difference. <clears throat> For a multicultural author of fiction who has been nurtured on many literatures of the world. The composition of her works is a matter of choice between models, some of them better represented in certain national or regional cultures, and it is a matter of balance between these recognizable references. F firstly, we must note that the basic gesture of Lahiri's narrative is the short story. The basic genre of Lahiri's narrative is a short story. Even the lowland, long novel, has a structure that would allow its dismantlement into several short stories. Although the short story is still more common now in the USA than in Europe, the main Indian novelists of the 20th century, from Prenchand to Setu, and from Malkrajanand and Narayan to Anita Desai, have all published dozens, if not hundreds, of short stories. If fragmentation and multiplicity are characteristic of the Indian experience, they are also shared by the multicultural global experience of contemporary bodily migrants and internet surfers. This is where India appears as a prototype of the complex, often incoherent and paradoxical world in which we are all forced to live. In this sense, the fragmentation of Dovi Mitrovo, as well as its overall brevity, could be deemed more Indian and universal than specifically Italian, despite the language in which it is written. On the other hand, it resonates enough with echoes of Pavese, Bassani, or the early filmmakers, uh, uh, Neorealism, De Sica, Pasolini, Visconti, Antonioni, etc to be recognized as belonging to the Italian patrimony. Another special aspect, aspect of Lahiri's work is regional heterogeneity. Lahiri's attention to regions enriches and problematizes a supposedly single Italian identity, writes Nicoletta Pired. It doesn't really matter then whether Anusa declares herself homeless and citizen of nowhere, or proudly American, like Balati Mukherjee. <clears throat> proudly American, proudly Indian, or proudly Italian. We all live in a world in which authenticity is performed rather than authentic, but where performing it is inevitable. Jun Palahiri has been doing Indian English diasporic fiction as a genre illustrated by many others before her. She is now doing Italian fiction that could also be Indian. Retrospectively, we can wonder for how long Indian literature has been done, consciously or not, as a genre to which non-Indian writers, such as Paul Scott, or even in famous Kipling, could also subscribe in their respective eras. Thank you. I'm finished. Uh, like, uh, uh, how to say, Grazi Infinito, Professor, thank you very much for this very splendid lecture. It was amazing to listen to you. Uh,
also add the poor basha and there is pratim and everyone is here uh, so uh, uh, professor if you want we can like take some questions from the audience and we also can discuss some questions among ourselves i hope i can hear the questions well uh, i hope you also heard me uh, because the sound is not always that good when you were uh, presenting me uh, earlier i could hardly hear you there was the uh, sound was coming and going all the time i hope it works uh, is it uh, audible right now they like, can you hear me properly now a big banner can you hear me properly now yes we can hear you yes you can start uh, you can begin the debate if you want okay uh, yes like uh, like as earlier we spoke about professor like when you were i was talking to you about this lecture like you said uh, this essay uh, this this talk you just presented it's a shorter version of an yet unpublished essay on heteroglossia uh, that you i think uh, it is from your book that will be you will publish uh, against origins uh, yes uh, it will be uh, in a different form and uh, much longer uh, um, section or chapter uh, rather of uh, against origins uh, at the same time uh, um, uh, i was asked by uh, debashish lahiri to uh, write a piece for an anthology or a critical anthology on uh, um, 21st century uh, indian writing in english uh, and uh, since i had been working on that i Uh, uh also gave a different version uh, of, of this work to him uh, all three versions are different <clears throat> uh, i was asked to write on poetry but uh, uh, i would have loved to but i didn't have time <laughs> so <laughs> i reworked again and again this uh, the question of uh, uh, jupa lahiri's heteroglossia uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, which I have found uh, uh, teaches us a lot. Uh, it is a, uh, a case study that uh, is much more interesting than it would seem if you only consider uh, this is an exception, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 something original. It's not. Uh, it is emblematic, I suppose, rather than original. Yes, and very good. I mean, good luck to you for this forthcoming text against origins, and also we have another text coming, migrating minds. Good luck to you for both of them. We are very much awaiting the publication of both this text. And uh, going to the questions, uh, we like the first question is uh, from Pratim Dash. He is asking. I'll show it on the screen as well. Uh, Jhumpa Lahiri's decision to immerse herself in Italian perhaps a significant decision and my question is here do you think this decision will change the fate of diaspora studies I haven't uh, understood the end of the question uh, you... he is asking that Jhumpa Lahiri has changed writing from english to italian so will this change reflect as she is a very prominent author in the international circle So, mm -hmm. will this change reflect uh, in also the fate of diaspora studies in general, the discipline? Will it reflect <coughs> something? Well, uh, from the point of view of, her, of the reception of her work, uh, I think it is not uh, it's not very successful at first. With altre parole, she attracted a lot of attention. And then it seems that uh, Dovin Mitrovo, whereabouts, uh, is not very well received. Uh, it has appeared to some uh, uh, critics in Italy as uh, a bit simplistic, uh, as uh, uh, <clears throat> not quite an achievement. And um, uh, I think that uh, <clears throat> uh, its interest Uh, is precisely to remain untranslated, to be uh, <clears throat> uh, contained within the limits of 
uh, reading it in Italian. Uh, for example, I will ju just give one example. <clears throat> uh, she, she has a long list of words to uh, the character uh, and the protagonist of the, of the novel uh, has a long list of words to say how uh, despondent or uh, uh, distant she is from her surroundings. Uh, this list of words uh, may have equivalence, uh, list of adjectives, may have equivalence in English, but uh, they will not attract uh, the same uh, cultural context as they do in Italian. So they can be considered as tr untranslatable. And this is what's interesting about it. Now, the choice of translating it into English uh, herself, I think, will um, uh, or reduce the interest of, of, the, of the movie. So uh, it is very ambiguous uh, shift. Uh, I think that you uh, can characterize it maybe as a, a way uh, of um, uh, renouncing the uh, facility, the uh, um, uh, uh, the easygoing attitude that you could have with her literature in, in English. It's not going to do her any good, certainly, for uh, her uh, public, that is, uh, uh, majority of which is anglophone. So uh, it is courageous, but uh, uh, as a stunt can be. You see what I mean? <laughs> yeah, even Alex, yeah. she did a PhD on uh, it, it related to Italy only. Jumpal Iris PhD. Yeah, well, she did her PhD on uh, um, the Italian Renaissance. Uh, Italian Renaissance. Yeah. Little, little by little. Uh, led her to, uh, uh, to to make this choice of object <laughs> for uh, of cultural law, uh, uh, and she has uh, approached Italian later in life. Uh, she was what uh, no, was 40, 47, uh, 46, 47. <clears throat> uh, she has approached Italian as something that she has left aside uh, as a uh, um, uh, as uh, someone <laughs> linguistically speaking, but as someone would uh, uh, would uh, find again on the street uh, uh, a childhood love. <laughs> this kind of thing. <laughs> it is it is very interesting that. Uh, uh, this uh, linguistic shift, this shift of languages, uh, uh, can be uh, written uh, validly as a metaphor of a love story. Uh, 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 metaphor of love story that uh, she could have written in English in her <laughs> in, the, in her fiction. <clears throat> And like, uh, you know, you have said about people critiquing her, the Ita Ita people in Italy, people in Italy critiquing her shift to Italian. She's but at the same... Hmm. Yes, yes. It's not very well received in Italy. Dove mi trovo, now it has been published uh, two and a half years ago. And mm. the, uh, the uh, reviews I, I, I could read in Italian, Mm -hmm. by Italians uh, are not very favorable. They are not a style to it in terms of uh, uh, what is she doing uh, mingling with her language. Not at all that. They find that it is uh, conventional in a sense. It's something that is uh, uh, that uh, perhaps recalls too much um, the uh, Italian uh, neorealist uh, writing, uh, especially Italian neorealist film uh, of the 50s. 50s. Okay. 
and uh, like uh, in one of our uh, one article a newspaper article i read that uh, one of her colleagues said that how her italian colleague he praised her for her writing and she uh, herself i think uh, she in this interview she told that uh, what you what you say in the pronounced joy in italian la joy joy if i'm not wrong i don't, I don't know how to pronounce italian it's trying and she said i found joy in writing italian i it's like falling in love all over again so <laughs> if uh, that can happen to a writer like her is an indo american writer and with an bengali roots and then american roots so in the context of india mm -hmm. Uh, like we have heteroglossia in india itself like there are so many voices so many polyphonic voice like four voices multiple voices so many dialogues together it's, it's like everything is interlinked in a cultural web together in a literary web and linguistic web together so what do you think in the context of india like being like like from me i'm bengali like can i switch to another language and write and maybe switch to another language and write Uh, and then also sometimes people don't take that seriously or they don't they critique you but what do you think in the context of india like if, can you like say something on that i mean can a writer go from uh, um, uh, another way of reading again another way of reading this uh, the shift and uh, especially uh, um, the first Uh, like his first novel in, in, in Italian, I suppose there, there will be more. Uh, still very active, um, and, and certainly uh, will have the desire to write more novels, short stories in Italian. Uh, um, uh, I said that um, this uh, uh, fragmentation, the structural fragmentation of her writings in italian it is uh, much greater still than the fragmentation of her writings in english in diasporic uh, indian american uh, english <clears throat> uh, this uh, structural fragmentation uh, has uh, another side uh, by uh, uh, trying to be adopted into Uh, Italian literature adopting the language and trying to be adopted into the literature and the culture of Italy. Uh, uh, in a sense, she is uh, 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 perhaps trying to find a unity, a wholeness, uh, uh, something more unclosed, despite the cultural disparities within Italy, than uh, the Uh, culture, the cultural position, uh, and uh, uh, the political class positions, and so on, uh, of the uh, of uh, that she could have as uh, she could find as an Indian intellectual or an Indian American intellectual. There is perhaps a quest of unity, as well as maintain uh, a way of maintaining fragmentation. So it is quite ambiguous. Uh, I think it is interesting from an Indian point of view to give this Indian reading in both both ways as uh, um, um, enacting the uh, uh, representativity the, uh, um, uh, of uh, the, the Indian uh, complexity. Uh, 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 the uh, representativity of Indian complexity is uh, similar and uh, prior to global complexity, diversity, uh, on the one hand, and also as a need to uh, find uh, uh, secure roots, in a sense, in a much narrower space, cultural space. Like that of Italy, so it is going both ways, uh, and it could be uh, similar to some people who uh, uh, nowadays uh, uh, write in uh, uh, Indian people who sometimes write uh, in English or 
uh, have written mostly in English and from time to time they write in a, a minority language of India, not in Hindi, but uh, uh, say in uh, <clears throat> Uh, in a uh, Dalit language, for example. So <laughs> Italy could play uh, the role of something uh, uh, that give the security of being tribal, in this sense, huh? or being narrow, uh, uh, confined, but where you feel more secure, in this sense. Hmm? It reduces complexity. I think it goes both ways. This is, this is a very interesting idea you gave me. I haven't said this in my, in my chapter or in the paper. <laughs> thank you I'm for this suggestion. <laughs> Professor, thank you. Like You have given us a new way of uh, look. I mean, we know she has published Dovmitrovo and everything. We read about it and uh, some, maybe some of us had read the book as well. But still, like this lecture has highlighted and through through like through light to like different perspectives of reading Jhumpalahiri's work from the perspective of comparative literature as well. Mm. And uh, I, I I always mean my uh, work to be uh, uh, cooperative in the uh, most uh, daring uh, sense. One question. May I ask one question? Why uh, comparatist 1919? <laughs> uh, yes, Professor. Like as you said in the beginning, uh, uh, maybe uh, there was some voice break. You couldn't hear it. Uh, like uh, in 1919, Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee uh, in Calcutta University, he started the Modern Indian Languages Department. That's a kind of uh, precursor to, we can say, the, the, the present department of comparative Indian language and literature that was started in 2005. It is also, <laughs> but yeah. it is also a worse date. You know, it is a date of the Amritsa massacre. Yes, the, that same year, yes. So it's a, a strange coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we also have another question from Pratim. Uh, uh, do you think this rejection of the English language by a prominent English writer, where the market presents to her the world uh, of a writer of Indian English literature, diaspora literature, which is sold as a world literature in Euro American bookshops? But when the writer is trying to create a new identity by changing the language of his literature in his writing, the idea of world literature in another language, which is controlled by English, is getting a little shaky. Uh, what is your take about take on this thing? Yes, well, I will uh, uh, try to answer giving uh, an anecdote uh, that was striking for me. Precisely uh, in a bookshop on College Street in Kolkata, uh, quite a number of years ago, yeah. I was uh, uh, looking at um, uh, how fiction was classified. And there was uh, Latin American fiction, <clears throat> uh, magic realism. Who was there? On, 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 on that uh, shelf, Salman Rushdie, together with Garcia Marquez. This is an example of how uh, more and more uh, in whatever language people write, in whatever language people are read, which is often different thanks to translation, uh, people read uh, according to genres. And uh, in this sense, uh, this is what I was saying in conclusion. Uh, this would be another proof or, or another piece of evidence in this sense. I think that uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, wherever uh, uh, the fiction is classified in uh, uh, bookshops in the uh, United States, it will not uh, change our status that it is translated from Italian or that it is written in English or that it 
or if it uh, were translated from uh, from Magali, uh, people are not uh, the readers in uh, this globalized cultural world, <coughs> are, except nationalist readers, obviously, <coughs> uh, are not very interested in what language something has been written. They are interested in the genre that represents a cultural matter. So language has become secondary in this sense. And uh, uh, from this point of view, it may be a <clears throat> very uh, significant move for the author to write uh, in a uh, different language, uh, as it has been significant for me to stop writing uh, literature, especially poetry in French about 10 years ago, and writing only in English and Spanish. Uh, it is a significant personal move, but then uh, for the reader, uh, I don't think uh, language has become so important. It is more a spirit of the genre. And in this sense, uh, I suppose that in the United States, the self-translation is, is good, is strong, it needs a strong translation, not a feeble translation like the title would suggest whereabouts. If the translation is strong, if it is also, if it is a source oriented, if it gives a sense even of uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, of the dreariness, of the uh, uh, fragmentation of the um, of uh, this uh, the life uh, descriptive, then it will be. Uh, read probably in the United States as belonging to the hyper-realist uh, genre of Raymond Carver or, or even of Cougar and this kind of people. Uh, uh, and it will be treated as uh, uh, American. <laughs> the, the origin, the Italian origin will not matter. This is, this is just a guess. Like that. But I think this is the way things are now. Uh, 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 wherever they come from, uh, uh, especially fiction, it is different with poetry. Uh, but with uh, fictions, narrative fictions, uh, I think where it comes from, uh, as in the case of uh, uh, international, the very uh, international writers like Murakami are now. Uh, it doesn't matter that she's Japanese. And because of that, it no longer matters that uh, uh, Kobo Obe is Japanese too. Although Kobo Obe is very Japanese. But it doesn't matter, it's a genre. <laughs> and, uh, Lee, uh, also, uh, Professor, do you write in Italian? You, can, you said you can read and speak in Italian. Have you ever written in Italian? I, uh, I I cannot write or speak Italian properly, but I can read it very well and I can translate from Italian. Uh, so I, I read uh, I read all the Italian writings of, of uh, well, it's I am a professional comparatist. No. <laughs> Italian is not very difficult language when you are trilingual, fully trilingual in. Uh, Spanish, uh, French, and English. So uh, I read all three, uh, and also the short story it was published separately uh, by uh, uh, by Jumpalairi uh, in Italian first, and then I took the, the English translations uh, that are a bit uh, deceptive. Uh, when they existed, Dove Mitrovo is not published yet. So, and I, uh, I will uh, read it as soon as it, uh, it is published to see what she has done with her <laughs> translation, <laughs> said translation. But uh, in Altre Parole was uh, professionally translated by, uh, by a translator, uh, Goldstein, I think is her name. Uh, um, she said why 
she didn't want to translate it herself. Uh, then I don't know why she has translated <laughs> the Vemitrova herself. So I will uh, compare this text. It always teaches you a lot to compare a translation uh, or a transposition with uh, supposedly original text. You know, I uh, uh, once uh, uh, <clears throat> I uh, gave uh, uh, the uh, few pages of uh, most remembrance of the past to read to my French students uh, in English, in Scotland Christ translation, uh, before they read the corresponding, I said, imagine that it is the original Scotland Christ translation. And then you will read the corresponding pages in keep it of the of the uh, um, uh, of the research. Uh, you will read the French in Kipit, as it is published in uh, definitive editions, as if it were a translation from Scott Moncrief. You will see it's not a very good translation. Scott Moncrief has interesting things to say that Post couldn't say in French. <laughs> <laughs> uh, translating one's own work, is it? can we call it transcription then? Um, the translating? What? Translating one's own work, like Lahiri did, mm -hmm. and many other authors do that. Uh, so, can we call it transcription? Mm. No, it is uh, uh, the, the, the heteroglossia can take many different forms. You know, as uh, uh, it was said in the presentation uh, uh, 15 years ago, uh, I, uh, I wrote. Uh, uh, a bilingual novel, it is bilingual in the sense that it alternates French and English. Um, not mixing them. There uh, are seven pages in French, seven pages in English, and so on and so forth, all with two different um, narrative streams, two versions of life. Um, so, uh, two points of view. And, uh, it's a dialogue between languages, between the protagonists in this sense, two different points of view. Uh, so uh, now I'm uh, uh, having another uh, uh, very interesting experience, something I had not done before. I am uh, giving uh, Spanish versions, very different Spanish versions of poetry that I had initially uh, written or sought to write in English, in French and in English. And uh, uh, it's a new text and it tells me a lot about the English or the French versions. So uh, what is really uh, what uh, a comparatist attitude uh, brings uh, is uh, uh, an incredible uh, enrichment of one's reading, of one's perspective. You have to move to other languages, to and fro, and with the third language always. I think the three languages is the minimum. <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise you are always in a, a kind of a family relationship eh, with uh, uh, mommy and daddy, if you have only two languages. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in this question, I mean, it's a very broad question, uh, Miss Huma Dutt has asked, but I think maybe you can say it briefly and like, how far Actually, are translation and uh, how far are translation and comparative literature related? Beg your pardon? How far are translation and comparative literature related? Uh, uh, Miss Huma Dutt is asking, how far are translation and comparative literature related? The in, whatever you just said now in this context. This is a question. I know this is very important. Book and uh, uh, I will try to answer this question a little better in my the third book I have planned on uh, uh, translation and comparative literature. Well, this was, uh, this oscillates between uh, total uh, lack of relatedness 
between the two disciplines, I mean, of translation theory and comparative literature and literary theory on the one hand, uh, translation being then considered as uh, uh, transmission, as a pragmatic uh, activity, uh, and uh, an identification of uh, comparative literature with translation studies, which was, this began with uh, Susan Bassnett's book, uh, first book on, on the topic, uh, comparative literature handbook from 1993. And then she has developed it in further uh, essays. Uh, but um, this is not at all a simple question. I think that assimilating uh, uh, translation studies with uh, comparative literature or world literature is not right. <laughs> Definitely not right. Uh, this is a question. Uh, the linguistic element is certainly very important but as a vehicle of uh, uh, cultural patrimony, cultural dissidents, and so on, so forth, not as such. Uh, because if you uh, are only concerned, as Emily Apter, for example, another case, uh, I don't like her work at all, <laughs> very tied to uh, translation zone and so on. If you consider that uh, it's all a matter of untranslatables and constant translation, then in fact, uh, you are, uh, uh, you, you abandon the uh, multiplicity, the constant movement, not between two languages, but between uh, uh, myriad possible cultures, imaginary cultures. Uh, literature is not about uh, existent, extant cultures, but it's also about imaginary cultures, but possible cultural ones. And this is what comparative literature has to deal with rather than with uh, linguistic specificities, uh, 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 worldviews attached to certain languages, as in the sapir or uh, hypothesis. You know. So uh, I, I, for me, uh, um, uh, translation studies is a tool, but it's not uh, assimilable to uh, cooperative literature. Well, this is a brief answer. I will develop it into a book. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> okay. It's a question. Uh, we who are students and scholars and practitioners and teachers of comparative literature have been dealing for ages, and we have to deal for many years now. Uh, we have another mm -hmm. question, a very interesting question from Obunago Moitro. Uh, he's asking, uh, in terms of style, uh, Obinobo is asking, in terms of style, can we say that Amitabh Ghosh is the complete polar opposite of Jhumpa Lahiri? Is that what? Is that the opposite? Is, uh, in terms of style, the writing style, can we say that Amitabh Ghosh is the complete opposite of Jhumpa Lahiri? I, I, I don't, didn't know the name. Who? Uh, Obinobo Moitra is asking. Amitabh Ghosh. What was it? Uh, Sorry. Which name? Sorry, Professor. Did you say Amitav Ghosh? Yes, yes. Uh, this uh, uh, Mr. Mo yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Oh. Moitro is asking that in terms of writing style, can mm -hmm. we say that Amitav Ghosh is a complete yeah. opposite of Jhumpa Lahiri? Yes. Well, the opposite, there is no such thing as opposites in, 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 in writing, uh, uh, in style. Uh, what I can say, I, uh, I love Amitav Ghosh's work, uh, uh, most of it. Uh, I, I've written a lot on the Ibis trilogy. This is the other next book, <laughs> it will come out. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, read uh, about everything uh, he he wrote, um, especially in the Ibis trilogy. Too. Uh, 
remain closer to the present. Um, what uh, Gosh does uh, is uh, a form of heteroglossia that is babelic. Uh, you know, it is uh, a mixture of all sorts of dialects, words coming. He has a long list of dictionaries that he has used and informants that he has used to, to write the trilogy. So his writing style is informed, if you can use this word, writing style, which I don't like very much, but uh, it is informed by <clears throat> uh, desire for totality. So, uh, it is informed by uh, 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 almost, I would say, by a Baroque hubris uh, that, is, uh, that is compensated, uh, <clears throat> in a sense, by the, uh, and contrast with the humble destinies of his characters. Uh, uh, I, I would say that uh, <clears throat> uh, the uh, uh, central character of all the IB trilogy uh, is Devi. And uh, Devi is someone who uh, uh, can speak only a dialect and then uh, ends up being the uh, mother, the uh, 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 I would say almost a mythical mother uh, in Mauritius, Germica uh, uh, Michael. Uh, um, uh, so, uh, her uh, trajectory, uh, the trajectory of Devi in, in the Ibis trilogy, is from uh, 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 dialect uh, 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 regional dialect in India to a pidgin or creole that uh, mixes uh, uh, um, uh, French. Uh, African languages uh, and uh, mixes and unites uh, French, African languages, Bhojpuri, and, and so on. So, this uh, there is a, uh, I would say, really a, uh, that Amitav Ghosh's style, the complexity of his writing, long sentences, and so on, uh, reflects. Uh, a desire and aspiration to totality, uh, totality uh, uh, in a sense uh, that locally was um, that of uh, um, <clears throat> Balzac, uh, the human comedy, the human comedy in the South Sea. Uh, this is uh, what I see it like, and it was there from the beginning, but it has developed in such a way that indeed it's not the opposite, but it's very different from uh, uh, Jhumpa Lahiri in the sense that she um, uh, is always looking at a one or two particular, very specific locales in her English writing and more in uh, Dovimitrovo, which is situated in the south of Italy, implicitly. So uh, she's looking for a locale, and uh, her uh, characters, uh, when they feel good about something, are, for example, uh, uh, can identify with Rhode Island, which is a very small place, <laughs> very small part of the United States. You know, she needs a landscape. And uh, uh, Amitav Ghosh, in his writing, his style, uh, uh, needs many landscapes, wants to see many landscapes at once. When he was, uh, what he recounts uh, about his uh, uh, stay here when he was a PhD student in Egypt, uh, near Cairo, as uh, of Cairo, uh, he needed also several landscapes. He needed the uh, past landscape of the Middle East traders and so on. At the same time, uh, he 
uh, was always comparing uh, his experience of uh, um, uh, Bengali peasants with Egyptian peasants, uh, ways of life and so on. And this appeared already in the vocabulary, in the choice, for example, of um, uh, giving their uh, real local names to uh, monuments or to uh, tools and so on. So it's a very different attitude, certainly, reflected in the style. But the uh, uh, realist, the realist drive is the same in both writers, I would say. Yes, sir. thank you so much. Uh, Jemima, mm -hmm. I think this is one last can question. We, uh, excuse yeah. me, can we stop? Uh, Soon, yes, yes, Professor, absolutely. I'm just a bit exhausted since. Uh, yeah, 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 you can understand. You can understand. Yeah. The period uh, at the beginning, uh, I was very anxious about losing the connection. So now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was absolutely fine. Thank you so much. Uh, I will ask uh, Protein to deliver the formal vote of thanks. Uh, Protein, if you're here. Yes, uh, yes thank you for the formal vote of thanks. And uh, once again, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor, for joining us today. Thank you so much. Uh, Pratim will deliver the vote of thanks and we we'll conclude the session. Uh, sorry, thank I don't think I just muted you. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, on behalf of the team calculated the competition 1919, uh, I would like to convey our hearty thanks to Professor Didier Kosh uh, for his enriching lecture on heterogrossia and its concept with preference from Jhumpa Lahiri's work. Uh, big thank you to Professor uh, for sharing your ideas and views on this forum uh, and I would like to express our uh, sincere gratitude and also love to uh, hear from you in near future. And also, thank you to our uh, audience on YouTube for being with us today. Uh, uh, thank you for the active participation and your questions. Uh, so uh, here, I, here I am concluding uh, the, the session for today. So thank you and good night to everyone. Have a good day to Professor. Thank you. Thank you.